Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about analysis. I'm Jenna Mathiason, an objects conservative based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservative based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Yeah, welcome everyone. Yay! Hi, hello, Hi. Christina. I know, dream team back together. Right, so today we're going to be a bit sciencey, but before we put our lab coats on and glove up, we're going to just do a very quick uh, shout out to the Emerging Professionals Network because they are looking for students and emerging professionals to share projects. Uh, it can be any kind of project that they can feature on Facebook and uh, I think blogs and stuff as well. So if you're working on a thing, even if it's in progress, they've got a nice little form that you can fill out uh, and it can be a featured project. And that's a really great idea for, you know, some boosting of people's profiles and stuff. So we're definitely going to put a link into uh, all of that in the show notes. So do check that out if it's something that you want to participate in. And we've also been given tons of requests to promote people's webinars, which is a great idea, except we record these quite a bit in advance. So actually, by the time they're actually out, your webinar may be well past. Uh, so actually, what I'll do is I'll be retweeting things that you want me to be tweeting from the SeaWorld account. And uh, when applicable, I'll try to put some links in the show notes, bearing in mind that those will then be a little bit outdated when people go back to the the episode at a different point in time but uh, thank you for getting in touch we will try to boost you via social media as opposed to giving a shout out on the show because it's it's just not super feasible um because of how we're recording these um but thank you for getting in touch and i'm so glad to see there are so many webinars on it's ace this is what it should be like all the time not just in like covid times we're doing really well I think. Yeah, I've been. I was watching a YouTube video on the mixing of solvents, and oh, yes. um, I remember when I was studying and early, like you know, a couple of years ago, thinking, why are there no, why aren't there like YouTube, yeah, type resources that we can use? And suddenly everyone's sort of getting out of the bag because it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's great. It's been really really great to see, and that this can only be a good thing. Like it's fantastic to see the kind of resources that are coming out of this. It's really really mm-hmm. great. But yeah, so shout out to everyone who is producing stuff like that and sharing it. Um, we do try to share it when we see it, but also we're, I think like everyone a little bit overwhelmed. So sometimes I just take days when I'm not on social media because I I just can't hack it. So. Um, Bearing in mind that sometimes you might need to tag us or get in touch with us so that we do actually see it and retweet it. But um, well done, everyone, for doing what you can. Um, Oh, I've got one other thing to say. I'd like to give a massive shout out to Preservation Equipment Limited, please, who uh, sent me 200 metres of cotton tape. Oh, wow. Because... They saw a tweet that I'd put on there saying that I was volunteering to sew scrubs and scrub bags um, for various care homes and hospitals locally. And I'd I'd just asked any conservators who had some random bits of cotton tape to send them to me. But um, Pell were absolutely amazing and sent me not just one reel of cotton tape, but two reels. So I've now got 200 metres, which um, I'm giving out to loads of other people who are sewing scrub. So I am so grateful for that. Thank you, Pell. That's fantastic. Tiny round of applause. (laughs) Great job, guys. Back on track. Today we're going to talk about science. Well, analysis, really. <gasps> I thought I'd start with asking us what, like just going around the table, what our experiences are of um, harnessing science for good. No, uh, analysis in particular. <laughs> um, I think I probably have the least to say, so I should go first. <laughs> um, I've only really done scientific analysis while I was at uni because at all other times I haven't had access to it um and i'm personally really in- excited about recording this episode and really interested to listen to the interviews we've had in for this episode because it's a totally different perspective from one that i've had i i don't think in terms of analysis because i i don't have the access to it i don't think oh what could i find out what could this tell me about my treatment because it's just not an option so i do have opinions about the different methods and i do use microscopy but that's that's it. I mean, that's fair enough. And that's that's a very good point. Um, Christina, do you want to tell us a bit about you? Yeah, I, I because I was lucky to have a couple of contracts, actually, at the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is quite a researchy kind of museum in yeah. terms of conservation, um, and is one where 
the Conservatives are in the slightly kind of luxury position of being able to do analysis. I say luxury position, but actually, you know, ideally, this is something all Conservatives would have the time to do, is to be able to investigate objects thoroughly and find out about the materials and the techniques and the processes and so on. But as you know, that's not always possible. Mm. And so the two things I was involved with really most while I was there were the sort of quite simple lab-based analyses. So I used to use microchemical spot tests an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Um, There's an amazing book by Nancy Odegaard and uh, other people. I'm just having a look on my shelf to see if I can find out who else it's by. Um, Anyway, it's uh, it's basically about all sorts of really simple chemical tests you can do to characterise materials. Mm. And using these, you can find out whether something contains nitrates, for example. So if you've got a sample, a small sample of an old adhesive on an object, and you can take a small sample of that adhesive and test it, and it tests positive for nitrates, then you know that it's quite likely to be cellulose nitrate. And you can use that information to help you remove the adhesive Mm, as efficiently as possible. Sure, yeah. Similarly, there are tests you can do for sulfates and all that sort of thing. There's a bioret test you can do for proteins and find out if something's animal glue or whatever. So fantastically useful, these things. They're really simple. I don't think they're used as much as they should be, partly because you need quite a large number of reagents to be able to do the full kind of range of tests. If you were to sort of pick the 10 most useful tests, you'd probably end up having to buy... 20 or 30 different chemicals and then store them all and so on so that's quite a hassle oh, wow. yeah, yeah but yeah. if you have got them really really useful and i think underutilized in conservation so interesting the other thing i did an awful lot of was uv photography uv fluorescence photography mm-hmm. i ended up uh, i started off with a um one of those handheld uv lamps you know but in the end i bought uv fluorescent tubes for a task lamp because Mm -hmm. i was able to illuminate things much more evenly and much bigger objects and so on and we set up a sort of dark room where we could do uv photography of objects and you can get so much information particularly a lot of the egyptian objects that i was working on in the fitzwilliam museum Mm. have been conserved you know sometimes three or four times since they were excavated 120 years ago yeah and so you find that they're actually this complete patchwork of weird <laughs> restoration materials. You know, you can start to map what's been going on. And sometimes you can work out how many times an object has been broken and put back together and oh, you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. So again, I think that's quite a basic thing, but also super useful. I don't know if it's sort of not being used as much, but um, I have come across quite a few students who don't routinely use that. I often forget about it. Yes, yeah, same. Yeah. I do have a, I've got a UV torch and a UV, just a standard UV lamp at work. A lot of the stuff I work on is really big, so we don't have dark room type yeah. options and there are big windows in our studio, so that's not, it can be a bit tricky. But it's the photography side of things that I find, um, you need a you need a proper filter on your camera, don't you? You can't just no. snap away. No, you can. Can you? Yeah. And in fact, you don't want a filter because a lot of cameras have a UV filter that's designed to cut out UV. Yeah, so I... Uh, Which is fine, actually. You want to cut out the UV. But what you're recording is the visible fluorescence when the UV has excited the materials, if you like. Mm, And if you can see it with your eye, you can photograph it. The only advantage of photographing it like this is that often because it's quite dim, you need quite long exposures. So it's quite helpful to have a tripod and do it over a two-second exposure, for example. Right, so this is something that I forgot from studying because I definitely did this whilst I was studying, but my memory just failed me. I'm much the same because I do have... I used to have a torch. I think that one broke. But I still definitely have like a like a bench-mounted lamp so I can look at something. So it's the light source is kind of above and you can have something on the bench and look at it on the UV light. And I so rarely use this because I kind of forget that it's there. And that's funny because it just means that it's not in my workflow and that's... Like, that's kind of something that I should really improve because it's there and it's clearly underused. I should mention the health and safety yes, <laughs> issues no, absolutely. here as well, probably. Use goggles, guys. That, <laughs> yes, we put a, yes, exactly. Wear goggles, wear a lab coat, wear gloves, cover all your exposed skin and put a sign on the door so that people don't accidentally walk in because even yeah. though it's highly unlikely they would be exposed to a dangerous amount of UV, you need to do that as well. So, so yeah, that's just my shout out for UV. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one of my favourite things. Um, and I feel it's a bit of 
the kind of Cinderella of techniques. Yeah, that's a good shout out. The other technique I used an awful lot while I was at the Fitzwilliam was Raman spectroscopy, which is an instrumental technique. So more what people tend to think of when they're thinking about analysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that you've got a massive great box (laughs) on a bench that contains a laser and, you know, that sort of thing. And I ended up being trained how to use that. That came about really because um, we wanted to, we had an awful lot of pigments that we were trying to identify uh, as part of a project to look at our ancient Egyptian coffins and papyri. And we initially, because the Fitzwilliam Museum is part of Cambridge University, we initially tried to do that by borrowing one of the machines from one of the other departments, but they were all completely busy. So actually, in the end, we ended up borrowing a Raman spectrometer from Anglia Ruskin University, which is the other university in Cambridge, Mm -hmm. and their forensic science department were really keen to be involved with us because, of course, as forensic scientists, analysing and characterising materials is what they do an awful lot of the time. So So there's actually quite a lot of similarities with conservation. So we made a space in our basement because that was the part of the building that's kind of most stable And it's really, really important that the machinery isn't subject to vibrations all the time from, you know, like school groups trampling around and so on. (laughs) And we had it in our basement for, I think, about six weeks, something like that. Um, A few of us were trained to use it, but then I went on to carry on using it and spent quite a lot of time taking samples from coffins and papyri and so on, mounting them on slides and then taking them to Anglia Ruskin to the Forensic Science Department and using their equipment in situ to identify them there. And so that was a really interesting process for me. Um, In one of the later interviews you'll hear with Paula, you'll hear her say that one of the advantages of being a scientist is that she's looked at thousands of spectra and can learn to sort of understand them what she's seeing just from Mm. her long experience and I can totally empathize with that because I looked at about 300 or 500 samples of you know spectra from red ochres of various kinds and so on and you do start to sort of understand patterns and see patterns and even when your spectrum's a bit kind of noisy and um, has been affected by other things you can start to interpret it a lot better yeah obviously I mean I was I was nowhere near as expert as a scientist but it was really interesting experience for me as a conservator to be doing that it's a really good point because I suppose, right, circling back to kind of what I've done. So at my core, I'm a science buff. I love science. That's I'm really into that. I very nearly became a chemist or a physicist. But then I strayed into this madness that is our world here, uh, which I love. Basically, I ended up using FTIR at university for my dissertation. Now, FTIR is Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. I have a love-hate relationship with it, is going to be my honest and frank answer. It's a scary-looking machine that can find out useful things. It produces a spectrum that you can interpret. It is a mildly destructive technique in that you kind of have to squish something onto a a disc or you have to make a disc that's analysed inside the machine and stuff like that. So it's invasive to a certain degree, depends on what you're doing. But it's a fantastic technique, but you do have to know what you're looking at. And that's... A real problem when you're a student because <laughs> you don't know what you're looking at and you're trying to figure yep. out what the different peaks mean and really what you want is like a star trek tricorder that tells you <laughs> this is um a very old film of cellulose nitrate you're welcome it's what i want however that's not how that works instead it's like ah the, the atoms they bend in a certain way here and they vibrate in a certain way here and that could mean that there's carbon involved oh great um so it it does take a tremendous amount of effort to kind of interpret these and make it make the results into something useful which is where scientists are really really useful so shout out to heritage scientists because they have a greater wealth of experience and expertise to draw on as a student that was a pain in the butt because it was just like well i don't actually know how to interpret these very well and whilst i can look it up and there are great databases out there for comparing your results against to kind of give you an indication of what you're looking at it's it's hard work i really really enjoyed it but it was also really really hard i think that's actually a really important point you're making jenny that these aren't you don't just kind of point something at an object and then magically get 
a really definitive answer. Yeah. That there's a huge amount of interpretation and uncertainty, and there's all kinds of things that kind of affect your results. So with the Raman spectroscopy, a lot of the time the binders would cause background fluorescence, for example, which sometimes the fluorescence from other materials in the sample would be greater than the signals you were getting from the sample itself yeah and so you know you were getting signals but they were just completely overwhelmed by this gigantic peak of (laughs) fluorescence instead and so a lot of it's also about just kind of managing your samples or trying out different things and I guess the thing is that a lot of the stuff that we do in conservation isn't perfect or clean. Like a clean sample is yeah. basically impossible because yeah. what, what you're getting as your sample is going to be it's going to have dirt in it. It's going to have other contaminants in it. It's not going to be the perfect sample. And in many ways, the machines weren't made for that. And it, not to say that it's impossible at all and it's still valuable, but it's going to be a lot harder than I, what people might expect. Again, it isn't a tricorder. <laughs> I feel quite comforted by hearing you say that. My love-hate relationship for FTIR is, I'd say, probably about 95% hate. Because (laughs) my, when I, and this is, maybe this is a good indication of how I feel about analysis. Unfortunately, because most of the analysis I've done has been at university. And when I remember, when I think about analysis, is sitting in the lab in Cardiff, learning FTIR and doing a little experiment myself and having no f- idea what was going on at all <laughs> and basically people going okay so this and this and this is suspect blah 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 and this is how you work and I was just sitting there and I felt like I was gonna cry and my Aww. sample didn't work and I didn't I hated the idea of scraping something off an object anyway I couldn't get it to powder or whatever you were supposed to be bloody doing and then the thing came up and it was just like a total mess I didn't understand and from that point I just backed away that's very unfortunate that you had a bad science experience and I'm really sorry about that it wasn't the fault of the course I just I don't have the brain that helps me understand some of these things I think that science can be communicated to anyone and people can pick it up um, I think maybe I needed like two months and we had two hours or so that's an exaggeration but we didn't have enough time for me personally <laughs> we, we were trying to get through a, a tremendous amount of different yeah. techniques and stuff like that so you know fair enough yeah so I, I guess like you Chloe actually most of my experience with analysis is uni-based because since emerging from university it's just been a case of well that's not available so other things that i tried at uni i mean microscopy which i still do like i still have a microscope and i do still occasionally use it it really depends on what i'm working on because sometimes i just work on huge things where a magnifier is literally more useful to me than a microscope is and stuff like that so it really depends other things we tried at uni, right, so Cardiff had a, probably still has, a scanning electron microscope, which is a really cool machine that creates images by scanning a surface with a beam of electrons. It's very cool. It creates a very high detail, like close up image of a thing, um, a thing that you have to coat as well. So it, it has to be conductive. So it's coated in like carbon or gold and stuff like that. So it's butter coated, I believe it's called. Cool. Yes. <laughs> But anyway, so that that sort of analysis does take a bit of preparation and stuff like that. And actually, I had nothing that ever was ever suitable for that, like looking at it in that way. So actually, I never played with that machine. Another thing we tried was x-raying. And I love Ooh. x-raying stuff. I did like x-raying very much, actually. It was great. Uh, I should say that we had, um, what I'm going to say is a manual x-ray but like not digital so we we had a dark room and stuff and you know proper like photo plates and stuff and i loved it it was so retro it was fun you could only do like small things because the chamber was only so big there was a bigger chamber but i can't remember what its deal was uh this is a long time ago now i'm old but i really enjoyed x-raying i guess uh, tremendously i do just remember that i really liked doing that sort of thing but again since since leaving there i've not worked anywhere that has an x-ray machine i have actually yeah and so i me. did i did work in one museum which kind of effectively built its own x-ray chamber slightly oh alarming. what um, we've got an ex-engineer to come and build it for us say, and it was Doc checked Brown? out by the um, <laughs> by the radiation protection officers and so on um, and it was fine um, but we did have a chamber. But then for bigger things, we had this kind of X-ray set 
that doesn't operate in a chamber. It's just this big kind of box and um, that fires a beam of X-rays at your object and you just have your plate standing up on behind the object. Amazing. Because we were doing this again in a basement area um, and X-ray coffins and cartonage mummy cases and things like that. Um, and you, you basically, you get your object, you put your X-ray plate behind it so that the X-rays will go through your object and onto this photographic plate um they were in sort of yellow envelopes they were kind of like a3 size and then um so if you had something big like a coffin you have to do it in sections and then um you stand this x-ray box thing (laughs) on the floor so it's pointing at the plate through your object and then um go out of the room and there's like this sort of external control box so you can control it from outside the room and while it's in operation this big kind of klaxon goes off and a orange flashing light is going off (laughs) exciting this is tremendous this is like Frankenstein's laboratory. This is amazing. <laughs> this is an actual thing. And we got loads of amazing information about it. What was inside the coffins, all kinds of random screws and nails. With the coffins, we were able to see the woodworking joints that had been used in their construction. So it's fantastically useful. I feel like if the, if there's something that I would genuinely just love to have on hand as something that I could use, it's definitely an x-ray machine. But they are tremendously expensive. So um, that's... Well, that's... we borrowed it so yeah yeah I, i've no idea how much it would have cost even quite an old one like this i have to say as well jenny the dark room was my favorite favorite place to be because <laughs> you could just go into a darkened room when everybody else was getting quite stressed <laughs> and stay in there for about two hours developing plates oh. with just this gentle red glow i know it's it was so lovely nice. But yeah, so I tremendously enjoyed x-raying things and like all that. That's amazing and would love to do again, but it seems very unlikely. All of that stuff was pretty much uni stuff. And now it's really back to basics um, from, from my point of view. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, I suppose. I mean, I guess that's just the... I do love that we talk about how it would be great if everyone could do these things. And yeah, it would be. I mean, unfortunately, that isn't true uh, or isn't the case, I should say. But actually, you do talk in some of your uh, interviews, Christina, about how you can get some analysis done even if you don't have the facilities yourself, don't you? Yeah, is this a good time to listen to the interview with Sophie? Yes, I think so. So originally this kind of came about because I was working in relatively large museums um, where the analysis wasn't necessarily something that you could do yourself because clearly, you know, some kinds of analysis need equipment that you wouldn't necessarily have. So, I mean, initially I worked in a really large museum, which had a whole separate section of of the museum dedicated to scientific analysis. And if you wanted to have that done on your artefacts because you thought there might be, for example, a salt had appeared and you needed to understand what that was in order to make recommendations for the environment, then you had to commission it and you had to make a case and then you might or you might not get that analysis done. Um, And then I moved to the Fitzwilliam Museum and there it was much more enjoyable, actually, because as a conservator, you know, when I was trained, I learned how to use some analytical equipment. um, And at the Fitz, we actually had a chance to do that. So that was really enjoyable, you know, to actually use some of the skills that I'd had, but also... In that museum, there was a a kind of assumption that you would always carry out analysis on things because that enriches our knowledge about the objects tremendously. And although on any particular individual object, it might or might not make much difference to the treatment, once you've been doing it on on a lot of different material, you can start to see a whole group of objects in a different way. And I think the thing that really struck in my mind was, you know, that I'd been working on Egyptian artifacts. And I remember reading Lucas on this. and He goes, yes, it's all coloured with ochre and there's no ornament on anything. It's very rare. And then as soon as you start looking, when you really look and you yourself as a conservator, you can actually visibly see ornament. You don't even need to analyse for it because it's really obvious. It's got these very sort of flat plates. And you realise it's actually on loads and loads of things, but because it fades, you can't really tell that it's there and it's often been mixed with other stuff. And so you realise that some of these kind of assumptions that you read, in, old, especially in older literature, but I think you see this in ethnographic material and in some archaeological texts that people say, oh, yes, they all did this and they all did that. You realise it's so much more subtle than that. There's so much more variation. And also some of what they said was just wrong. And it was rather kind of, oh, well, we know the answers and we're just going to say what they are. And I think that that takes our knowledge of those cultures forward and, and makes it less kind of homogeneous. It makes us realise that, you know, smaller groups of people do things a slightly different way, just as we do now. So I think that sort of, you know, understanding of whole groups of material is really, really important for the understanding of culture in, in more depth. So that's why I'm, you know, was very happy to work in a museum that seemed to see that 
it was necessary to do analysis just as part of conservation, as a routine part of it. Um, and as that was very much how I was trained to approach objects in the first place, I was trained at the Institute of Archaeology, where they're really interested in the information that you can get out of objects. Um, I found that that just matched my interests really well. So that was great. And then later, I worked in a much smaller museum where we had literally nothing. I'm not sure we even had a UV lamp. And at that point, I still felt, well, look, you know, we can still do analysis. We can still find a way to make this happen. And so what I actually then started to do was try and see if there were ways to get it done, not by us, but by other people. And um, there were two routes for that, really. One of them was because we generally had student interns who were at the Durham course or the Institute of Archaeology course. And both of those courses teach analytical methods as part of what they do. And so the students also, while they're on placement, still have access to the analytical equipment. So we could give students samples and they could go away and analyse them back at the ranch, as it were, where they came from. Um, and so that was a really great way to get access to analytical equipment, um, which we otherwise wouldn't have had. And the other thing, of course, is to kind of make friends with analytical people <laughs> and try and, and sort of develop some networks. So, for example, I think I got some um, work done by the Heritage Smells Group in UCL. They were looking at um, kind of volatile organics and we had some weird smells that we were a bit concerned might actually be a sign of something potentially corrosive in one of our stores. And so we got in touch with them and, and they used our store as a sort of dummy for them to kind of just try out a new technique. And something very similar happened with another group who were looking at uh, proteomics, which is where you can identify species looking at the protein peptide fingerprint of them using a very sort of low level abrasive method. You use a little rubber eraser and then you can analyse the little worms that come off the rubber eraser and use that to identify the species of something. And they were also testing that technique out at the first time. This was the bioarchaeology group at, um, in York. So by kind of cultivating those friendships and then offering your material as an opportunity for them to test out a new method, you can get individual objects done. And I, I was very lucky that I managed to get that work um, carried out. But the downside of it, of course, is that if they're testing out a new method, they want to publish that. So if you want to publish anything that you've done, you have to wait for them because they are the, the more important partner, as it were, because they're the ones with the new research idea. And the other thing is, it's incredibly opportunistic. So you just, you get the results that you manage to get, but you, you can't necessarily plan to do a whole sort of suite of treatments or a whole suite of analysis on something. And so it's not strategic at all, but it is, nevertheless, it is valuable. Um, and certainly in that smaller museum, we did that work on a, a, a pair of gut parkers that we had. And because we managed to get so much more information about that gut parkers, we were then able to use that particularly for outreach. And because we had all that extra information, it could make it into a really interesting story, really, about those gut parkers and told us a bit more about it and also allowed us to say, I think they were made of seal gut and were the seal species, the ones that people always said they were and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think, felt it was valuable. It didn't make any difference in, uh, in any of the cases that, to the treatment. I think it's quite unusual for the analysis to change my treatment decisions. But I suppose I might say that I've always felt that my treatment decisions should never prejudice analysis in the first place. So, in other words, I'm always aiming to treat something in a way that isn't going to prevent analysis happening either now or in the future what you're talking about here then is getting information about the technology behind the objects and the materials and so on, um, all of which is part of a conservator's kind of wider role. So understanding conservators as people who understand the objects in the broadest sense, rather than just people who do things. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. But maybe this is partly because I work on organic objects. You know, in a way, we're rather behind the times in analysis with organics. I think that those technologies, you know, FTIR, GCMS, are ones that either haven't been very well developed yet for organics compared to what's possible for metals and ceramics, or they're just fantastically expensive. You know, the people just haven't got that equipment. So perhaps we are we're working in a slightly different way. But it, there's so many really interesting things that would be really great to know about organics, like you know, what were things used for? Lots of people do things with oils and varnishes and libations and all sorts of interesting stuff, which is really difficult to get information about now, because those are the kinds of things that are more complicated to analyse for. And when I've worked with ethnographic material and um, archaeological material, I think that generally there is a culture of minimum intervention, um, either because of cultural sensitivities or because of the potential to ruin your object from an analytical point of view. Yeah. Um, so we just tend to work a lot more with trying to do things by mounting as far as possible. You know, you, you use a mounting technique rather than a consolidation technique, if you possibly can. If 
the analysis that you're trying to get for your objects isn't having a direct impact on your treatment decisions. Have you managed to get support from the museum more generally for this kind of work? Or have you ever faced a sort of, no, you're a conservator, your job is just to treat the object, so sort of get back in your box, <laughs> as it were, stop, yes. st- stop but, encroaching well, on the think, uh, curator's territory. <laughs> I think there's certainly an element of that. And I think particularly if, if you have a dedicated science department, it isn't always easy to get um, analysis done because you think it's interesting to do. You have to make a proper research case for it. And I think that would always then be a collaboration with your curatorial team and mm. the scientists and the conservators all working as a group. And I think with the smaller ones, the reason why nobody fussed about it was because it was free. I didn't have to pay for any of this work. You know, it was done because mm. of the of that sort of networking approach. And because then, you know, there was a very clear impact back as in you can use that to make your outreach activities more interesting for people and you do have to put some thought into using that knowledge creatively not just sort of oh well now we have an interesting fact but actually making sure that that's kind of more widely disseminated or you get people excited about the thing or you tell your story in a a more exciting way and you you show people what that interaction between the collections and scientific research is and I think we all just have to be quite savvy about making sure that those things you know, come out of it at the end. It isn't just, you know, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. You mentioned the cost as well. And obviously, yeah. <laughs> a lot of museums have no budget whatsoever for no. analysis. Um, have you found other ways to be creative about that? I mean, by using cheaper alternatives to the very expensive high tech analytical methods that we always think of? Not particularly, but I've always, I mean, there are there are more things that can be done with spot tests. That's one of the things I've mm. always felt. I'd love to know more about spot tests because I think that with so many more instrumental analysis uh, machinery coming on board and people being very excited about all of that, there's perhaps a tendency to forget that in the past that's what people did. Mm. Um, I, I've got a very limited knowledge of what spot tests can do, but there's a fantastic book about this by Nancy Odegaard that I can picture. And you, you, yes. know, you want to know, can I test for this? You can go and look. And uh, so I think that's something that's definitely worth investigating. Um, And of course, there are lots of more sort of test strips and, you know, things that will detect lead and things that will detect acids and that kind of thing available that you can try. I think the other one that I'd really love to know more about, and it's because I've never had time to develop this, is UV light. I think there's a lot Mm. that could be said about UV light. And I think what we need in this world, this is my my little purple book of UV. Perhaps Mm. we can write it together, Christina. Um, (laughs) (laughs) what you can do with uv light and and actually you know proper photographs show you what the diagnostic features of something are yeah. because i don't think it's something that's ever really been produced and uh, and yet you know it would give people confidence to experiment with that a bit more yeah i've 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 always thought you know if if you have just a basic lab there's probably quite a lot you could do and as you said spot tests are hugely useful they can often tell you what kind of adhesive has been used in a different conservation in a previous conservation campaign absolutely yes so actually in a sense for conservators they are really useful they might not tell you so much about the technology necessarily they they might but they might not but but certainly from a conservation point of view if you want to understand how am I going to remove this old treatment or what might the impact of that old treatment be you know you can find that out more easily using that yes it can tell you it's cellulose nitrate for example or whatever so that's that's the one that I do do that is the one spot test that I often do but yeah you talked previously about FTIR and GCMS and the difficulty for conservators in getting to grips with these techniques. Have you had experience of actually doing analysis yourself, however, possibly using other techniques? I mean, in my training, I learned how to use a scanning electron microscope with EDAX, with that uh, elemental analysis to it. And I've also used called XRF. And both of those things are quite easy because you get you get very clear peaks, you know, what they do, it, it, you know, the mm-hmm. software beautifully labels the peaks for you. It says, right, you've got potassium, sodium and iron or whatever it is. You, you know, and that then you can use that to tell you, hmm, well, if do I think I have a problem with sodium chloride, for example, and if you have a huge sodium peak, well, then that kind of helps you answer that question. I mean, there are clearly some elements that don't show up because they're too low down in the periodic table. So, But you can get, you know, the metals and various other things, and that's useful. So I think there are some techniques that are very easy to interpret, even for someone who's basically quite a rookie with them. Um, for my dissertation, I used FTIR, sorry, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. And that, I have to say, I think is actually quite a difficult technique. You get a lot of very sort of 
spiky spectra. It's not always easy to tell exactly what each of those point peaks on the spectrum are telling you. If they're telling you anything, it's it's if you don't sample well or your sample is difficult, you can end up with such a sort of muddy looking spectrum. It's really difficult to interpret it at all. Um, so actually, uh, my one big research project at the moment is trying to develop an easier way for people to analyze specifically plastics. Is there a way you could identify plastics using um, spectroscopy, but a very cheap spectroscopy? So nowadays, um, near infrared spectra spectroscopes are, can be made very, very cheaply. You can buy the bits on Amazon and make one for 50 quid. It's not very good, but you can do that. So, um, But an FTIR machine is about 55,000 pounds. So it's clearly <laughs> out of the way people. And the other thing is when you have an FTIR machine, in order to be able to use it on objects, you have to use it in attenuated mode, which means you have to hold your object right up to your 55,000 pound machine. I'm not sure what's more stressful, you know, this very expensive machine, which you either have to kind of manhandle onto your artifact or your artifact that you have to manhandle onto the machine. And then you still don't get a spectrum that's at all easy to interpret. And I think certainly working with students and looking at it myself, I've had a real sense that you often, you, you have some results but you don't really know what they mean you don't you can't take anything terribly useful away from them so you do need a specialist to help you I think to understand what you're looking at and that of course is another reason why it becomes quite difficult for a a normal conservator to do Um, so I'm really interested in developing something that's a bit more accessible and which is also kind of object friendly because I don't think FTIR is (laughs) at all object friendly Um, yeah so uh, have you got anything else planned for the future (laughs) I'm not sure I can answer that. Very God, simply. sorry, I actually completely <laughs> forgot that we were in coronavirus lockdown right now. So <laughs> I was so having such a good time thinking about museums and objects and analysis. I actually forgot we're at home. <laughs> at home, and we can't go anywhere. Um, when I'm allowed back in the lab, <laughs> I have a lot of spectra that I've already collected on plastics, and, and we're at the point now of trying to analyse those. And actually, because of COVID, I find myself thinking I might actually have time to sit down and look at the um, at these spectra and see if I can kind of make some connections and uh, and draw up a specification for this tool. But yeah, but I think what's going to happen with that is actually I'm going to make a collaboration within the University of Cambridge with people who specialise in sensors, mm. so that I can get some proper scientists to uh, to look at what I'm doing and. Uh, take it forward okay well sophie ray thank you for talking to the seabird today thank you very much it's been a pleasure so i found that that really interesting i found it inspiring because of the getting the opportunities where they are so collaborations with other people and christine like you were borrowing equipment and stuff and it's made me think like oh maybe if I personally felt more comfortable with analysis techniques that weren't just microscopy and UV light, maybe I would actually feel more enabled to contact people about it. Actually, I think it's really important that conservators understand these techniques and understand, broadly speaking, how they work and what they can do and what kind of information you can get out of them. But I'm not sure that people need to be able to do them themselves necessarily. No, no, definitely. And I think it would be really useful to have a low cost conservation science facility nationwide (laughs) that could do analysis for you. That would uh, be amazing. Just at the cost of, you know, whatever, 10 samples, for example. And so they're sort of constantly they're funded by taking work from all over the country, as it were which would then be economic, whereas for each individual museum, you'd only have to pay for a very small amount. And I think it's a shame. I can see there are all sorts of reasons why we don't have this kind of facility, but I think that could be incredibly useful. Absolutely. So while we're wishful thinking, I would like to pick that up and say, I would love that. If anyone has an idea to do that and like a million pounds in their pocket, to set that up (laughs) i what i really want what i think that would maybe lots of people would really like as well is basically a commercially run conservation science lab as christina says that would then be able to look at objects with the conservator with the owner saying right what would you like to find out these are the techniques, this is how much we can, blah, blah, blah. Because some of the things I think that I struggle with 
and if I think, all right, if I did have access to all of these things, how would I feel? I think I would still kind of struggle to know what is possible still. Mm. I would say, I mean, yes, I absolutely agree. And actually... Here I'm, I'm thinking that actually Christina has a second interview, uh, which is also really good. Um, and actually that sort of thing kind of gets addressed in there. So actually, should we listen to Paula's interview now? I'm Paola Ricciardi and I'm the Senior Research Scientist at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, where I've been for the past eight and a half years now. The Miniare project is what I was hired for at the Fitzwilliam. It was the brainchild of the former keeper of manuscripts. Um, she really wanted to engage with scientific and technical analysis of the manuscripts in the collection, in addition to the research that she had already been doing. And so I was hired um, almost nine years ago, and uh, we started a project, um, which is still ongoing with about... 4,000 manuscripts, I think, in the collection. Okay. Like that. So there's lots lots to um, analyse. We'll never run out of, of beautiful things to analyse. But I also now work on the rest of the collection. So I don't just analyse manuscripts anymore. My own specialty is painted material. Um, manuscripts, uh, first and foremost. But um, because of the similarity of materials, um, I've now had a project running with a paintings conservator, Christine Kimbrell from the Hamilton Carr Institute. Um, for about almost three years now, we've been looking at English portrait miniatures from the Tudor and Stuart period, of which we have quite a few in the collection. Um, and those are also painted in water-based media on parchment, just like the Renaissance uh, manuscript illumination. So we're using the exact same sort of research protocols to inform our analysis of this a completely different type of, um, of object. So how did you come to be a uh, heritage scientist or a research scientist in a museum? So I have an undergraduate degree in, degree in physics, um, but as a little girl, when I was about 12, I really, really wanted to be an archaeologist. I was passionate <laughs> about history, and, you know, and the past. But someone made a mistake of telling me that I would have to learn Greek in order to be an archaeologist. And I okay. thought, oh, that's way too hard. I'm never going <laughs> to do that. Um, so I went on and studied physics instead. <laughs> um <laughs> But basically, I always had an interest in both science and history and, and, and art and archaeology. And so um, I was very fortunate because through my undergraduate degree, I could take some classes on um, carbon routine dating and archaeometry, which is the application of scientific methods to archaeological objects. So basically, I, I started specializing in this already from my undergraduate and I, then I went on and did a master's degree and a PhD in heritage science, basically. What kind of equipment do you have at your disposal in the museum? Uh, we have quite a nice set of non-invasive analytical equipment at the mm -hmm. museum. And I stress the non-invasive because, again, that's my specialty. Um, I'm not a chemist. Uh, I don't take samples. We don't do any sort of in-depth chemical analysis of the objects. Um, let's see. We have a um, multi-spectral camera. So that is a camera with 12 different filters in the uh, visible and near infrared range that allows us to do some multispectral imaging, but that we can also use just to do plain near infrared imaging. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have an XRF spectrometer, so to do X-ray fluorescence. Um, it's a very nice instrument. It allows us to um, get elemental information on the surface we're analyzing. We also have a reflectance spectrometer, that is a fiber based optical fiber based instrument that you can use to get reflectance spectra in the UV visible and near infrared range. And um, that gives you structural information. It gives you color information. So it's, it's almost an extension um, of a colorimeter, but it doesn't just give you a number for the color. It actually gives you a spectrum that can be helpful to identify, for example, a pigment, um, and if you look at the infrared portion of the spectrum, you can also identify some paint binders, some supports. Mm -hmm. We've used it for analysis of, of textiles, of gemstones, all kinds of minerals. Um, you can differentiate support, so paper from parchment, from wood, in types of textiles. If you've got a question about that, all of this is in a non-invasive way, uh, which is really nice. Um, and we also have a FTIR 
spectrometer, which we can use both in ATR mode, um, and that's sort of a microdestructive type of, of measurement, because um, you either do it on a sample or you have to apply a certain pressure on the object you're looking at. So I'd never be allowed to use it on a manuscript, yeah. for example. Um, and of course, we've got a microscope, you know, we've got the basic um, UV. Um, how did all of this equipment arrive? How did you get the funding for it? How did you... <laughs> Uh, because it sounds really impressive. It sounds incredibly useful. Uh, yes, I think we've made a massive... Um, it's been a step change for the museum, to be honest. When I arrived myself in October 2011, all I had was a digital microscope on my desk. Was that, that was my equipment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, our first idea was that we would try and partner with other departments in the university, like chemistry and physics, and just make use of their equipment. Um, but there were two big issues with that, or three possibly. Um, first of all, that equipment is heavily used most of the time, obviously, because, you know, they've got researchers and students, hundreds of them. Um, also, um, most of that equipment is not portable. So we would have had to take the museum objects out to various departments across town. And then again, that's not ideal. And then thirdly, a lot of this equipment is not really to do non-invasive analysis you know most of the analysis that goes on in physics and chemistry is on model samples or synthetic um, materials that they prepare or you chop off a piece of something to analyze it and we obviously <laughs> couldn't do that um, so we decided to fundraise our own suite of equipment and we focused on having equipment that was non-invasive but also portable the vast majority of what we have is portable. So I've taken the equipment onto a tiny little island in the Venice Lagoon years ago, you know, to do analysis on manuscripts there. <laughs> Just put it on a plane and then took it on the ferry, on the water taxi. Um, it wasn't easy. It took us a few years to put this all together. And we're continuing to build our, our kit. We, we've still got one or two pieces of equipment that we love to get and don't have yet. Mostly... Um, to be honest, we've relied on private funders, private donors, because okay. the purchase of equipment is really hard to fund otherwise, especially if you don't work in a scientific department. Can't say, look, this is going to pack on students because I'm going to use it as part of a lab course. So most of it has been private, uh, you know, trusts and funds and donations. What sort of sums of money are we talking about? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the cheapest, um, anything from... 10,000 to 80,000 pounds for a piece of equipment. Right. So quite a, a fairly substantial amount of money. It's for, substantial yeah. for a museum. Yes. I mean, not for a scientific, yes. I mean, in any university, but for a museum, it's, it's a lot of money. Could you talk a bit about your relationship with the curators and also with the conservators in the museum and how you feel your role fits in with those departments? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question. And, um, it's very different depending on what museum you work in, I have to say. Um, so before I came to the Fitzwilliam, I used to work at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, which is a much, much larger institution where conservation alone is about 80 people. Okay. Um, and the scientific research department is about 12 people. So conservators were my only way to get in touch both with the objects and with the research questions. I didn't have access directly to the curators. The Fitzwilliam is very nice uh, because it's a small place <laughs> and, um, and conservation is much more integrated within the curatorial department as well. So there's less of a divide, I feel. Um, then, of course, the conservators at the Fitzwilliam, especially the conservators of um, antiquities, had been doing scientific and technical analysis for years, even before I came, and do their own XRF or reflectance spectroscopy analysis. I've trained some of them. Yeah. Uh, of course, I'm always there to support and help and, you know, help look at the results, contextualize them. To be honest, I really do talk both to the curators and to the conservators at the Fitz. Perhaps there is a special relationship with the curators because the type of analysis they do, being non-invasive, is perhaps most suited to answering curatorial questions, so to speak, or questions about the original materials of the, of the work of art and of the object, the original technology, um, rather than investigate corrosion, you know, products or degradation processes. Those are a little bit harder to identify using this type of analysis um, and so in some ways there's not a, a, such a direct 
uh, impact of the majority of what I do on conservation practice. There is, however, impact in the sense that, of course, um, the research I do helps conservators understand better the material they're working with anyway. I'm interested, you said that you've trained some of the conservators to use some of the equipment. And that's, uh, to me, is quite an interesting decision, partly because um, I think most conservators would feel, oh, I, I, I don't know what I'm, I'm not a scientist, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh-huh. And partly because it makes me wonder how much a conservator could do and, and where you really need to have a scientist involved. Um, well, the decision to start training them actually um, sort of was born out of necessity because about a year in, in my contract, um, I had a child. So okay. I was at home for several months on maternity leave <laughs> and um, conservators still needed to do analysis. So, um, well, we'd done hands-on training at the museum, but then we had sessions, further training sessions at home while I had my little baby, um, and I would help them understand. No, literally, it was baby on one hand, conservators on the other side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was quite fun. Um, and we did some um, training in how you interpret the results. To be honest, the hardest thing to do is not so much performing the analysis itself. Yes. You know, it's not that hard um, to actually do the analysis is what comes after that can be hard and that's where the input of a scientist is really important so um, full interpretation of spectra is harder to do uh, I think as a conservator not because it's difficult but simply because as a scientist I've seen tens of thousands of spectra of pigments or metals or whatever we're working with and I might recognize things features that look odd and actually, I know what they mean. Um, or I might remember that someone else has identified the same pigment on a different type of object, and I can find the right reference to the literature and, and share that with the conservator. Obviously, there's a certain body of literature about heritage science and analysis in that context. But are you also looking at the wider literature about the use of these techniques outside museums? Absolutely, because these techniques have been sort of borrowed from other fields anyway. Um, so reflectance spectroscopy, especially the what we call fours, which is the fiber optic based types of equipment, they were developed for remote sensing. So they're compact and fiber based because geology students need to be able to put them in a backpack and go around the field measuring rock outcrops so that they can calibrate satellite images. Yeah. So there's... Um, the geological literature is full of, for example, uh, reference spectra for minerals, which are the same minerals we find used as pigments in many works of art. Um, but also I've had to look at geological um, literature for the identification of gemstones. A lot of these techniques, especially the non-invasive ones, are used for quality control at f- sort of factory level to look at food and textiles and um, animal f- products, all sorts of materials that we find perhaps processed, but in works of art. So, I mean, you're really kind of at the cutting edge of applying this in completely new contexts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's not as if there's been a long tradition of this at all. It's it's quite a new area. It is for some of these methods, yes. And are there other methods you think that um, could be borrowed then from uh, other areas of science or industry and applied to heritage science? Uh, for sure. I mean, there are probably many I don't even know of uh, yet. Um, I think some of the most recent applications include methods such as um, optical um, coherence tomography. So like a CT scan, but not with x-rays, but in the optical sort of visible and near-infrared range, because that can give you sort of virtual stratigraphy. So you can almost do a cross-section of of an object without actually taking the cross-section. I'm sure I think medical imaging, which, you know, is is starting to be quite widely used in the heritage field. But um, heritage objects are very complex. They're aged. The material you're looking for sometimes is in really low concentration. So we really need to push the boundaries of these methods, actually, um, to make them work for us. So you've talked about um, using quite a wide range of techniques. Do you feel that a heritage scientist has to be a real generalist? I mean, usually, and outside the very big institutions, you're going to be the only scientist. Yeah. How, how is it trying to get to grips with a huge range of different <laughs> techniques? <laughs> uh, 
um I think there are two ways of going about it. You can specialize in um, a type of analytical method. Yes. Um, and then you'll have to either work in a very large institution or, um, you know, the Fitzwilliam Museum holds a, a very, very wide range of materials. But if I were working in a museum with a more specific type of collection, I might be using fewer analytical methods, perhaps. Um, so if you're specialized in a method or like me, you are a generalist from the view of, you know, which technique am I going to apply and perhaps specialize more in the analysis of a certain type of materials. So um, my main, you know, expertise is on um, polychrome work. So pigments, paint binders, that's what you know the most about, which is not to say that I can't, you know, um, asked to analyze a metal coin I can do it um, but it might take me longer to get up to speed with the specific literature or I might need to ask for help um, what we've done at the Fitzwilliam again because I've mostly been on my own perhaps with students or young research associates coming in for brief periods of time we've really drawn on colleagues expertise heritage field is a small field we pretty much know yeah. all each other um, and we work together a lot so we've we've brought in expertise and equipment from outside. Um, you know, we've had countless um, visits from colleagues in the UK and in Europe and the US coming in maybe for a week or two, perhaps with a piece of equipment, and then just, you know, flat out for a whole week, all you do is analyze. And then you take six months to look at the data afterwards because <laughs> you need a very specific type yeah. of, of equipment or expertise in a specific type of material. It's not a one man or a one woman in my case um gay can't do it all and in terms of sort of feeling connected to the more I was going to say more mainstream scientific community but actually that's not really fair because this is totally science isn't yes. it yes <laughs> um but do do you how do you feel that heritage science is regarded outside museums mm, that's a really good question I think um a lot of heritage science doesn't have a good reputation in the scientific world, actually, because we're not scientific enough. Yeah. You know, it's candy cane science. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, but the point is, uh, there is some of that. And I think that's OK that we're not scientific enough because we just can't be. You can't yeah. always do controlled experiments if you're working with a one off, you know, beautiful object from a thousand years ago. But there's also a lot of heritage science, um, which does very sort of formally organize sci science and scientific experiments. Um, that's how you develop new conservation treatments sometimes. Uh, or, you know, that's how you, you develop new techniques and new applications of that technique to a specific type of material. Um, to be honest, I don't really mind. I don't really care what scientists, you know, the real scientists think about us um <laughs> i think i think a very important role to play because we are we are the people who can talk to everybody else yeah so a, a heritage scientist can't just be a good scientist we need to have good sort of general culture broad background because we interact with so many different people you know conservators and curators and our learning team and our digital team because more and more you know we want to make this type of research available to the wider public um so we really need to be able to speak different languages and act almost as a i feel like a, i often as a liaison between the real scientists who might come in with their expertise and their techniques and the rest of the museum and I'm the person who can understand a little bit of everything. Um, I can make sure we're all sort of working together. Um, and to be honest, it's it's such a cross-disciplinary role. Um, and I think that's where the world is going anyway. So you're the bridge, really, between... Yeah, absolutely. Uh... Absolutely. Completely between two or three or four different worlds. Um, yeah. And have to be comfortable with, with sort of all of it. And of course, you know, we might be a little bit better at science than we are at other things, uh, but we really need to understand all the rest of it too. And you haven't had to learn Greek, though. I haven't had to learn Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so you managed Although to... I can, I, I can recite a Greek alphabet, unlike lots of my friends who did have to learn Greek and I forgot it, I can still recite. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, well, Paolo Ricciardi, thank you for talking to The C Word today. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Like, I kind of like that she's she's kind of the go-between, right? She's the bridge. Uh, yeah, she puts she's it. the bridge. Of, yeah. of saying, you know, this is what this is the kind of information I can give you. How amazing is it to have that sort of person around? And I think Paolo's really happy to say, you know, I'm a generalist. That's okay. I'm not specialised in one thing. My job is to know a bit about everything as well. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Which I really enjoyed. I suppose I also like that she made the point of because as we were talking briefly about, wouldn't it be great to have a like a kind of centralised location that could do could do analysis for you she does make the good point of they had to take their stuff to a different location because that's where the equipment was originally Mm. um and actually that turned out to be a real sticking point that is one of the logistical problems is that well say that there's a magical facility in london because that's where it's going to be um (laughs) you all have to take your stuff there now that's that sounds fine if it's something you can actually say put in a car it's not fine if it's like a giant taxidermy lion full of concrete or if it's um (laughs) for example (laughs) just for example it kind of becomes a logistical nightmare trying to do that because it's the same thing that we talked about in the ipm episode where there are freezers available but you have to take your stuff to the freezer and actually that can be a real problem and i suppose that's where the mobile lab is actually a great idea Um, yeah absolutely and paula was talking about how um heritage scientists have been really keen to borrow sort of ideas for portable equipment yes um and i guess for a lot of other techniques um like you were saying jenny you can take micro destructive samples so just a few grains of pigment or a little tiny sample of adhesive or whatever and mount that and then i suppose you could take that to the facility elsewhere or even post them off yeah that's true you have totally reminded me that we took our mummy at the Fitzwilliam to Addenbrooke's hospital one Sunday morning. Aha! I was hoping that you would bring I up CT scanning. I remember sitting in a talk about that when we were in Cambridge. Yeah! We took a human mummy, full-sized male human mummy, and we took some animal mummies, and we also took a cartonage mummy case as well. Um, and we took them all in the van, packed them up really carefully, took them in the van, wheeled them into Adam Brooks. There were loads of jokes, obviously, about waiting lists. <laughs> so we wheeled in this 2,000-year-old Roman mummy um, and they did CT scanning. That is amazing. And obviously that's the kind of thing that can only happen if you are able to take your object to the yes. hospital. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, speaking of which, all right, so I've been catching up on the book and paper groups uh, kind of webinars and one of them is by David Mills, uh, who uh, was in our Arduino episode, unrelated to that, but uh, his talk was kind of about these interesting scientific ways of looking at things. And I didn't even know that like n- non-medical CT scanners were a thing. Like you can get small ones where you can only put something in that's about the what? size of a spray can, I think. But mm. that can still like do a CT scan of a small object. And that this is the sort of thing that, that they do where he works and stuff like that. And it was really fantastic to hear about. And actually, I'm going to I'm gonna put a link to that talk in the, in the show notes because it was great. And some of the cool stuff that they'd done. I didn't even know that was a thing because I just thought that you had to take everything to like a, an actual hospital. I mean, obviously, you do have to for something as large as a mummy. That just makes sense. But for smaller things, there are other options and I didn't even know. And my mind was blown. It warms my heart that everyone we've spoken to is saying, I love analysis. Analysis is great. FTIR is a pain in the head. (laughs) You know? (sighs) And that really amuses me because that's exactly what I thought when I did it. But uh, had the uh, impression that it was just all analysis. But no, it's just... It's just FTIR. Everyone hates FTIR, even if they love it as well. <laughs> I think also GCMS, I mean, I think organic materials are notoriously much harder to analyse than yeah. inorganic materials. Yeah, they'll always have very different challenges, for sure. One of the things that keeps coming up is the cost of analysis. And um, yes. pa- I, I was slightly staggered when Paula said that, you know, you need to look at raising <laughs> between ten and £80,000 to get a single piece of equipment. 
But um, I once worked with a textile conservator who was a visiting researcher in the institution I was working in. And she was using a technique I hadn't come across before called thin layer chromatography, which is a sort of chemical technique for looking at dyes and binders and things like that. Uh, And that was incredibly cheap because it just uses sort of basic lab equipment and chemicals and so on, but can be used as an alternative to the sort of high performance liquid chromatography. It's it's not quite, it doesn't have quite the same degree of resolution, but in terms of cost, it's kind of staggeringly cheaper. And so that was something um, we had a go at as well. It was quite a long time ago and I can't remember the details beyond that it works in the same way as any kind of chromatography where you're sort of splitting out your sample with a solvent effectively and um you know different components of your sample will travel a distant different distance along your piece of paper like we did this at school with we did paper chromatography at school with felt tip pens and so on where you put a spot of ink at the top of a piece of filter paper and then introduce a liquid water or alcohol or something that. like that and then your ink travels along you know the solvent carries your the soluble components of your sample along the filter paper and it splits them out into different components because different elements of your dye have different travel times um does that make sense it does (laughs) so you end up with kind of bands and so on but there's there's a thing called thin uh thin layer chromatography tlc not that kind of tlc um (laughs) which is um a really good alternative to that and um while trying to remember exactly how this works i found a really useful getty publication you know they've got all of these sorts of books that they put online so we'll put a link to that in the show notes in case anybody wants to have a go at this just in their lab basically the other thing i've done um, which i don't think we've mentioned so far although jenny you talked about microscopy is plm um, polarizing light microscopy which is a really good way of identifying pigments because it uses the sort of crystalline properties of the pigments to identify them so you're looking at their kind of the way they refract light um, and the way that they behave when looked at through polarizing filters and so on plm is very very widely used by paintings conservators and it seems hardly at all by anybody else and i don't know if that's because of the it's relatively technical and there's quite a steep learning curve yeah i'd be interested to hear what people think but i just thought i'd put it out there as another yeah that's good this is inspiring me to look at lots of additional techniques that one could use. That's good. I'm glad it is. I suppose in addition to this, there's XRF and XRD as well, which I've not tried either one. But again, it's cool <laughs> with x-rays, <laughs> looking at different things that x-ray does to stuff. And it's apparently amazing. But I know so little about it that I can't possibly say more. I guess this is probably a good time to introduce Paula's question to us. Basically, she said... She would be really interested to know from us, but also from our listeners, how useful is the work of scientists to conservators? Because we all tend to assume that more information is better. But actually, is it? Um, And one of the things that came out of the interviews I did with Paola and with Sophie was that actually a lot of the work the analytical work that went on didn't have any effect whatsoever on people's conservation treatment plans. Mm. It's kind of interesting to know about the object, but if you look at it from a strictly conservation point of view, it hasn't changed the way anybody approached the treatment of an object at all. That's so interesting. So actually, is conservation science that useful from a conservation point of view? Oh, I, mm, oh, oh! I love that. That's a great. Do you want to answer first, Jenny? Scratcher. Well, I'm I'm thinking of like, well, I suppose it, again, it depends on the information that we're getting and what kind of analysis is happening. Like, I found it tremendously helpful for. I'm going back to X-rays now. I found it very helpful to see what's inside an object because that did affect what I did, how far I took a treatment, how I would support an object. It affected all of those things. Mm. Yeah. Oh. I'm not being helped by the fact that I never ask these questions because I have no way of finding out. So for me, it's like, I'd love to know what that blob is on there, but I can't. So I I guess I don't take that question any further because I already know I can't answer it, which you could argue is bad practice, but is also just a realistic thing of my day-to-day, you know, working life is that I can't find out what that blob is. So it's, oh, it's, it's a good melon scratcher. I love it. 
But I, I don't I have think, a good answer. I think I could probably argue both at the same time and i think it has a lot i do i always say this i think it has a lot to do with what jenny's just said about it depends so much on the object and the question and i suppose also the value of the the information curatorially because we can't we don't operate completely separately from curatorial if the result of a piece of analysis is the difference between an object being an everyday object and the most important example of its type in the world, then that would mean your, I'd say, on a, a practical level, your attitude to the conservation would be different because it might be that you could go much further or that you would need to go much further because it was something that would have to go out on loan all the time or something. So even just from a what is this object going to mean to my workflow and my like the expectations from conservation i think that's definitely interesting yeah but um i was just thinking something that came up in in our plastics episode for example was that i would love to have thing just be able to go beep that's that beep that's that beep that's that because that would be useful to me because then that would affect the storage and display more than the mm. treatment because i still probably Absolutely. wouldn't be able to treat it but i might be able to pr prolong the life of an object Inf information is important i guess it's the information isn't always geared towards conservation in some ways i think analysis that can answer questions about construction and conservation materials previous restoration campaigns is genuinely useful yes and so i would put x-radiography and uh, examination under uv into that category yeah. and i think it's really interesting that those are both low-cost techniques that conservators can do themselves but if you're talking about the more high-end analysis so ftir and xrf and things like that then i think it does start to become more about curatorial questions often mm, if, you're, if you're considering sort of the broader questions about what pigments have been used on an object or what binding media or that kind of thing then i guess that does that's not really conservation question as such unless you take a very broad view of conservation which of course a lot of people do I mean, you you could keep it broad, you know, it could be about collections care, that sort of thing, right? Because, as I mentioned, it would affect the storage of an item or a display of an item. And I think similarly, you know, um, something I would love to do, but I don't have the means to do is to, you know, check what kind of pesticides are in some of our things. Because that, to me, informs the collections care. Like, how much PPE mm. should we be wearing as we're handling these objects? Are these objects that need an, anything special in, type, in terms of considerations? Those are more the sorts of questions that I have. So talking to Rob, he's got his example about working in his inter internship. He worked out how to safely lift a gigantic object using XRF. And that's really interesting. That's, I think, one of the a really good example of how knowing the materials can can directly influence the actual physical behaviours that conservators have to take. Um, I guess uh, to go back to what Jenny was saying about plastics, actually, the area of conservation where it is really useful to know this stuff then is collection care. And of course, I was thinking about it solely in terms of um, interventive conservation, where I'm not sure that this that these these very kind of high end techniques are necessarily that useful. But um, Sophie gave the example of the heritage smells yeah project, i love where that. they were able to get some samples analyzed because they had a weird smell in their store and they yeah, wanted to know brilliant. is it a problem or not and i think those are the kinds of um problems that conservators often have where you want to know you know are my plastics what what are they and how can i store them so that they won't deteriorate as rapidly and that's the kind of thing where analysis would be helpful and the kind of weird smells and um pollution monitoring and that sort of thing so I think the last thing I want to say is that it's just an example of, I know this is an episode about analysis, but I want to pick up on something that Rob said as an answer to the last question that I asked him in his interview. And I just thought it was such a beautiful response and such a beautiful attitude. Microscopy, I, for, I wasn't thinking about it in the beginning as a method of analysis but it really absolutely is and it's so accessible even if you don't have a microscope my favorite tool in my lab is a 
a little macro camera lens that I attach to my phone. Mm. And the micro, the magnification on that is really, really great. And it's told me so many things. I use the photos from it all the time in my work. And it's, it's was like five pounds, I think maybe 10 pounds at the very most. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think that was what I re- that's what I really enjoyed about Rob's last answer is that it's not about necessarily about all the expensive equipment sometimes you just need to look at something really close up yeah i mean on that note like analysis is just the detailed examination of either elements or structure and actually we do that with our eyes all the time like we're very good at looking at that sort of thing because that's part of how we problem solved that (laughs) thanks you know it is just how we problem solve so you know anything that enhances it beyond what we can see with our eyes is obviously a great thing but you know it kind of starts with what we can see hi everyone today i'm speaking with rob mcleod about his experiences with analysis and conservation would you like to introduce yourself and talk about your current role Hey, my name is Rob McLeod. Uh, I work at the Natural History Museum as a preventive conservative. I've been there since about November 2015. Uh, So some of the stuff that I do there, I'm uh, in charge of doing some of the environmental monitoring systems. uh, And I've also started to work for the past few years in a lot more of the analytical section. We don't currently have a conservation scientist there. So a lot of my work has been filling in for some of those roles, doing a few things like uh, portable XRF. And to a lesser extent, I'm trying to get back into doing uh, FTIR analysis as well. Start looking a bit more into our organics, along with some of our inorganic chemistry that we do with the XRF. So we actually studied at Cardiff together. And though we did do all of these analysis techniques, we learned about them, didn't we? Um, It wasn't conservation science. Um, So how did you get into this so deeply? I mean, when we were doing our course, part of it was uh, conservation science as well. And we had a lot more theory when we were doing it there. We did have access to uh, portable XRF there though we weren't allowed to use it which was very disappointing at the time especially <laughs> look at it and see that it looks like an awesome ray gun part of my interest really peaked when we were doing uh, microscopy mainly and I remember we were doing um, thin wood sections and wood ID of waterlogged woods also I think another thing that I was looking at was a couple of organic pieces of matted fur so there's a few felts and a few unidentified pieces so hair follicle analysis I think we got to the point where we managed to actually identify whether something was sort of like sheep wool whether or not you had horse hair human hair things like that and I think that detective work if you want to call it that <laughs> sort of piqued my interest in it mainly but I really enjoyed the challenge of trying to identify what some of these were and how finding out how that could actually help with things like actual remedial treatments on things by knowing the materials you're working with obviously you can choose better treatments you know I, I basically I think I just really wanted to be some kind of film noir detective <laughs> work out things with science the science hero well yeah maybe obviously like our course was much more geared towards uh sort of hands-on learning and objects conservation of all sorts of materials like we were quite lucky in our course i think like it was a really decent course at Cardiff Uni. Fortunately for me, when we finished that course, I decided to go absolutely berserk and throw my CV out to the entire world. And one of the places that got back to me quite early on was the National Museum of New Zealand to Papua Tongarera. Their head of conservation got in contact with me and said they were really interested in seeing if I wanted to come over for an internship. So obviously I jumped to the chance and went of over course. there. So, as anybody would. It was an amazing opportunity. And they actually happened to have a portable XRF that was exactly the same unit as what we were using in Cardiff Uni. They didn't really have anybody that was particularly experienced with using it. Uh, we just finished doing a load of our theory with how it was used and things like this. And obviously, uh, we had a bit of hands-on when we were in university with how the software of it worked and things like this. Mm-hmm. So they basically gave me the whole equipment and just went, you know, if you want to learn it and work out how to use it properly for us, that would be great. One of the first projects I did was looking at a copied Chinese seismograph, which was pretty cool. So it's like this giant vase thing, probably about two meters tall, about a meter and uh, half diameter. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was an awesome thing like this. And they, they thought it was bronze, but there was a few like weird cracks and everything going through it. So one of the projects I did was looking at this to work out exactly what the materials were because it's all painted over and things like that. Going through different areas with their XRF on that, you could see the differences in the metal content within there and see the different levels of sort of like copper and zincs and nickels and then for some reason swept up bits of iron in some parts. But the useful part of that was, as well as, you know, like the 
the fascination of finding out exactly what this was made of. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of informed us when we were looking at moving this thing. I mean, it, it weighed, I'm, I'm not sure how much, I think it was about 800 kilos or something like that. It was a good heavy. weight, yeah. As you know, half the fun of doing conservation is working out moving something from <laughs> A to B. Doing this XRF analysis, we worked out that there was a few weak points on there that we just couldn't possibly sling over. There was like some areas that looked like they would have been great, but actually were really badly brazed on. The work that I did actually managed to inform how we were going to sling it up, how we managed to get it onto a gantry and where we were moving it, which was great. You know, it's like a decent feeling of like accomplishment. Tangible response. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The Cardiff Uni course, it was quite nice that it was a bit free form in what you could really, not so much specialise in, but certainly what you could take an interest in. Mm. And I think that really sort of laid the groundwork for me going forward that I fortunately had the opportunity to just get thrown straight into doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. In an internship somewhere where they were quite happy for me to learn from reading articles from like core conservation and just apply that to the actual workings there, which was great. So tell us more about the analysis work that you do for the museum. I understand you do work for outside companies as well as your own collection. One of the big parts of the Natural History Museum is not just the fact that it's a forward facing museum for education purposes they've also got a huge research department which covers all manner of different things so one of the areas that conservation is actually placed under in the natural history museum is the core research laboratories what they do is a huge number of different kind of things uh, ranging from uh, organic chemistry doing things like molecular science and looking at dna analysis and all sorts of things like that to oh, wow. inorganic chemistry so that I mean, we've got quite a few different people coming in, working different contracts for different companies that mix with us. So we've had things like the European Space Agency doing a few different things with us. Name drop. That's cool. Um, they get all sorts of like wacky requests for different things. So it might be something as simple as uh, identifying like a rock. So we've had a few things come through to our meteorites curators to identify as whether they're meteorites or not, which is quite easy to do with things like XRF because you're just looking at whether or not you've got an iron nickel content and if you've got much else of anything else that generally tends to not be from space which is very disappointing for a lot of people <laughs> also to things that are more commercial side so auctioneers come over to us with uh like bags and trunks and things like this that they want to identify whether or not they're from a very specific collection so i was doing some testing uh with xrf again on that which fortunately was a really simple thing it's all sorts of things like um i did a collaboration with the royal college of music doing some pigment analysis for them on uh, one of their instruments. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's like all sorts of stuff that comes through and it tends to be... Um Fortunately for me, a lot of it gets weeded out before it gets to the point where I'm having to actually take it on. From that perspective, we've actually got people in the commercial sector that work for us that actually bring these things through for revenue. Um, and then I'm deciding yay or nay on the projects that they actually plant on my desk and whether it's mm -hmm. realistic what they're asking for. I mean, a large part of it actually comes down to managing expectations because people tend to think, particularly with stuff like XRF, that it kind of answers everything. But realistically, yeah. answers, but it sort of ends up posing more questions than it answers mm -hmm. after that, that I can't usually answer for people are you the one that has to communicate that so are you the one that has to manage those expect expectations uh yeah I, I would say so i mean there's a lot of misunderstanding i think with a, a lot of analysis that you can just like point a magic wand at things and it'll suddenly tell you why it was where it's made how it was made etc but really all it's doing is giving you the information to then go and do further research mm -hmm. so i think a lot of the stuff that i end up doing tends to be particularly in areas that i'm not so comfortable in my expertise with which probably pigments would be one of them these days would be that i'll do the original analysis find out what materials are there present them in a report to give over to either the tail end customer i guess we'll call them in this situation or client really or possibly it'll go in and we'll have further collaboration with other people that might know a bit more so particularly for things like paintings i tend to do a bit more with people from the vna on mm -hmm. things like this so there's a few collaborations with some of the stuff and i think that's probably one of the really good things about about the South Kensington site is that between the NHM, VNA, and Science Museum, we tend to collaborate quite well with sharing equipment and things like that. So certain people have got certain skills in certain institutions that we can actually manage to share between each other, which works out quite well. Do you feel that working in this way away from conservation has taught you anything or changed how you think about analysis techniques in conservation? So I think there's a few things that could probably be arguably transferable skills from it. And I think one of the main ones is what we touched on in the last question of managing expertise. Mm -hmm. The commercial aspect of what I do probably barely even makes up 2% of the actual analysis work I ever do. Mm -hmm. Most of it comes from inside the museum. Eight or nine times out of ten are our own collections. And then outside of that, it'll be 
be visiting researchers that have close contacts with one of the curators or one of our collections managers or one of our internal researchers. I do quite a lot of mineral analysis with that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that it's really helped with teaching me is how I talk to people before we start the actual analysis at all and of what I can realistically find out for them by doing things like XRF. It really weeds out people that don't necessarily have a question that they want answered. I can only really tell them, okay, you've got roughly this percentage of iron in your object or roughly mm-hmm. this percentage of like silica or wh- whatever, like things like this. It's kind of up to them to really decide what that means for them. Mm-hmm. So especially when it comes to things like uh, gemstone collections and things like there's a few people that come through and they've got what they're hoping to be like, I don't know, maybe a really specific kind of topaz from a really specific mining area. Mm-hmm. And like that's good things about the like detective work side of what we do is by using things like mining records and things like this from different areas, you've got like soil sample analysis. So you know what kind of materials you'd expect to find on something that was found in a really specific area. And you can actually narrow that down quite well. You know, that's really great, but I can't do all that as one yeah. person sometimes. <laughs> I don't think people realize this. I kind of like, here's a lot more information and a lot more questions for you to go back and find out for yourself. Best of luck. <laughs> Other things that like commercial aspect that's actually brought into conservation. A lot of it's the same sort of techniques. Mm-hmm. If you're, you've got a question that somebody's, you know, somebody's posed you a question that they're looking to answer. You decide what kind of analytical technique would be best for them to use. Most of the stuff that I do, I mean, I'd say like 90% of the analytical equipment that I use would be the XRF. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get back into doing FTIR, but I hats off to people that do it it's way more intensive you need to really know what you're looking at to properly identify something that's you haven't got a clue what it is so i feel like i uh, already know the answer to this last question very simply what is your favorite analysis technique yeah well i think i've made that really clear yeah right? <laughs> uh, you like the ray gun right <laughs> actually no i say that i, I joke to be fair, microscopy probably is actually one of the favourites, just because of how many people and how many institutions and how many different kind of places actually have access to microscopes to do things. Mm-hmm. There's so much support for doing these sort of things. Whilst it's viewed, I think, as one of like more simple analysis methods, it tends to answer most of the things that you're looking at. You, you've got like a Iron Age dagger that you're trying to work out what happens to part of the hilt. You just put it under a microscope and you go, oh, right, that bit's actually just corroded into this stuff and that actually looks to just be leather. Right, that makes sense. It's not dirt. Magic. Like, you couldn't see that with the naked eye, but suddenly all that stuff's there. I mean, the XRF aspect as well, yeah, obviously I really love doing that. It's, it looks science-y, it looks futuristic, it's, like, it's got a gun. It's actually probably a lot more simple than people think it is, but it makes you look really, really intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> And I think I'm really lucky to have access to these sort of things and the ability and especially like my um, colleagues and work, like the support that I've got to just kind of like blue sky think with some of these things and work out how to use this stuff and what's likely to be useful for us going forward. Yeah, I can't shout that out enough. Having the support to actually just look into these things, actually learn how to use them properly and being given the space to do that while still doing your job is very fortunate. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for talking to us. No problem. A pleasure. Welcome to the Benchmark Bar. I'm Amanda Richards and I'll be showing you guys today how to make the ray gun and the ray gun mocktail. So to start off with, you're going to need some whiskey, um, two ounces. So we'll pour that into here. And this one, there's no mixing or stirring or shaking. We're just pouring it directly over the ice. So I've got my short column glass here, or short whiskey glass, and pouring it straight over an ice cube. So now we're done with the whiskey. And now we're going to add just a splash of grenadine, which is basically just pomegranate simple syrup. So if you don't have that, um, then you, and you have pomegranate, you can make the simple syrup. And then we're going to do about roughly five to six ounces of Coca Cola. We'll pour that right on top. To garnish, we will do a slice of orange and a cherry. And you can do a little stir if you'd like. Just try not to mess up your bubbles there. And that is going to be your ray gun. Then for the mocktail, it'll be very similar, but instead of the whiskey, we're going to start with a drop or two of um, almond extract. Okay, 
and then a drop or two of vanilla extract. And these are just some of the flavors that you would find in like um, an oak uh, aged whiskey. All right, then we'll do another splash of grenadine. And then top it with the Coke. And once again, we will add an orange slice and cherries. And there you go. Now you have your mocktail rig gun and your whiskey based. Cheers. And now for some comments, questions and corrections. Some of you wrote in and let us know that the articles that we were talking about in the IPM episode were actually slightly incorrectly uh, attributed. The articles were uh, standardizing and communicating IPM data uh, from 2020, which is actually written by Henderson, Bars and Hopkins. Um, and the other one was Novel Ways of Communicating Museum Pest Monitoring Data Practical Implementation by Bars and Henderson. Thanks to everyone who flagged that up. And uh, we have popped links to that in the show notes, uh, both for this episode and the IPM episode. Thanks for keeping us on our toes, guys. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. Well, it's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. We're the C word and you've been listening to Christina Rosaic, Chloe Ramsey and me, Jenny Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about working with techs. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the C word podcast or simply email us on theseawardpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. Recording. Speak it more of a test. Uh, peak to test the was on. But which knob do I pull? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang on. Only my test levels and peak levels. That's two thirds. So. I feel like this is excellent fodder for Easter eggs to leave at the end of the episode. If anyone ever <laughs> well, listens to yes. <laughs> which knob do I pull, guys? <laughs> okay, if I yell, it's fine. I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Actually. Uh.